welcome. Thank you very much uh, for letting coming to the session. Nice, lots of many faces, so uh, thank you very much. But um, uh, yes, work for Telus Health, and I'll share with you a little bit, uh, kind of some of the trends that we're seeing, particularly from our data and research and insights. So. Very quick, who we are. So we are a global organisation, um, predominantly an employee assistance programme kind of provider, but we provide broader wellbeing services as well. We're live in over 160 countries uh, around the world, uh, and we look after approximately 35 million uh, people, so employees and their family members uh, by extension as well. So. Uh, as a result of that, we do get a lot of data and a lot of trends and kind of insights, as well as kind of other different aspects um, of research as well that we do. So we wanted to share that with you today. Um, there's lots of data on the slides, and I will probably rattle through them too quickly to, uh, for you to kind of get hold of all of it. But um, if you want the slides, come and find us on our stand afterwards. We'll send them over to you. There's lots of research papers as well that we can share with you as well. So please feel free to take advantage of that uh, rather than anything else. So just a bit of context to kind of the world and where we're at uh, and kind of what we're seeing from a, particularly from a mental health point of view um, and how we support employees in the moments that, that matter. So the reality is mental health is different now to perhaps two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Um, certainly the COVID years, as I'm now trying to call it, uh, certainly accelerated a lot of uh, awareness around kind of supporting people's well-being, particularly their mental health from isolation and kind of other aspects as well. In the UK, we've probably been pretty good at, at being open to talk around mental health, certainly less of a taboo, still pockets of it, but has certainly been improving significantly over the last 10 years particularly. But actually, we're seeing that shift and change across a number of countries as well. So um, if you take the Netherlands, for example, uh, and um, lots of uh, Dutch colleagues, uh, and the kind of typical response when I talk about mental health in, in the Netherlands is, uh, oh, we just get on with it, and we kind of do what we do, and it's kind of very uh, matter-of-fact kind of approach. But actually, over the last few years, there's been a shift in the Netherlands in particular to a bit more awareness around actually understanding a bit more about mental health and talking around it kind of a bit more openly as well. So again, we're seeing that shift and change across different countries um, around the world. Um, and we do know that productivity has been impacted um, from the changes around mental health over the last few years, particularly obviously from COVID, and I'll share a little bit more um, around that. And in the slides, I'm going to kind of show you kind of differences between cohorts, so for sort of sub-40 uh, age bracket to uh, over-40 age bracket, and some of the differences that we're seeing, um, because it's important to kind of understand the future of our workforces and that kind of under-40s and our future leaders, what their challenges they're facing, but equally what they're therefore bringing into their world, into the long-term part of their career as well, and how do we support uh, that cohort uh, as they go forward as well. And yes, there are lots of trends and challenges, but uh, we don't have to be passive in accepting accepting uh, those. So as I said, we do have a huge uh, number of kind of individuals that we do. Uh, we have a mental health index that we've been tracking for uh, quite a few years now from different benchmarks, benchmarks from prior to 2017-19, and we've been tracking it on a monthly and quarterly basis for the last three years. And we literally started it about two months before the pandemic uh, using from that point of on. So we've seen a huge kind of shift and change through that. Um, and a lot of people use our data and, and research for in their own organizations, but as well as governments um, around the world because of the, the richness of what we have. So I want to share this slide with you. So uh, when we compare it to 2019, this is your workforce now and today. When we look at the data that we have, we see that one in three workers are now at high risk from impact from a mental health point of view and their wider well-being. We do see a significant kind of increase, as you can see there, in terms of high risk drinking. Um, so as we've seen, uh, lots of changes in kind of health and habits uh, and you can ignore what I might do in a bar later on this evening, but we have seen that kind of change and actually the risk that has from a, from a health point of view, as well as therefore impact from a productivity point of view. And we do see that more and more workers are now more sensitive to stress. Yes, we know that stress is something that's a natural kind of reaction and response, and actually an element of stress isn't bad for us, but actually if it becomes too much and we can't deal with it, that's when we start having conversations around burnout that then leads to high-risk drinking and other health behaviours that we don't want to see um, from a workforce point of view. Um, but the good thing is it's not, uh, there is an age difference in some areas, but not all. So when we look at kind of under 40s and over 40s, we do actually see uh, to, you know, greater to double the kind of level of anxiety kind of impact and, and younger workforce, as well as in terms of helplessness and actually kind of an increase in isolation, um, which is not really uncommon and not unexpected when we think about a lot of that kind of cohort and work, workforce. 
have joined organizations in a remote setting. So therefore, actually, the ability to connect with colleagues, have that kind of peer-to-peer -peer connection, overhear conversations, it is a real challenge and something that I think all businesses are still trying to work out what the right balance is, X number of days in the office or fully kind of remote working, just teams coming in at different points. But we have seen that there is that kind of impact as well. But interestingly, we don't see any difference in the levels of optimism. Um, so in terms of that under 40 and over 40, the, the levels of optimism is very, very kind of similar across both age, age groups, and as well in perception of one's uh, own mental health. So as much as uh, sometimes we hear the adage of, are oh, the younger workforce a bit more sensitive, a bit more kind of uh, aware and kind of openly trying to talk around it versus kind of older, actually that's not necessarily true. We are actually equally as aware from, from a different kind of age groups across our kind of workforces. But the other aspect that is important to understand is what has been that change and shift over the last few years. So we measure everything kind of a, on a score from zero to 100. So if you're in an 80 to 100, you're at a pretty much optimal kind of mental health kind of or well-being kind of state, and then kind of going down to tears. And anything 15 below is, is kind of seriously strained and some uh, sadly kind of impact kind of uh, from that. And when we looked at the difference in over 40s and under 40s in 2019, there's a two points kind of difference in terms of the average score. So we can see that there was a little bit of a difference, but uh, not too bad. Bring that forward to 2020, peak kind of aspect of pandemic kind of hitting, is a nine points lower kind of difference. So we could see that actually the younger workforce were being impacted way more. And actually even as at the end of last year, um, and we've just released the latest stats, and you'll see some, when we come to our stand, you get some more, it has kind of continued to increase. So we are seeing, an impact in terms of that younger workforce and uh, what they're perceiving in terms of their mental health and ability to, to kind of deal with it as well. So it is something that we can't um, ignore. But we also then looked at terms of productivity. So uh, it's quite interesting to see, again, you can see that widening of kind of gaps of level of productivity as well. So we can see that direct correlation and cause from impact of people's mental health and their well-being actually does translate into their kind of aspects of kind of how productive they are as well. So it is really important to recognize that that is a correlation uh, and not just uh, a symptom, as it were. Um, but interestingly, productivity is not related to effort. Uh, again, uh, some of my peers would say, oh, the younger workforce, they're just not as motivated or not kind of keen and, uh, you know, kind of quiet quitting and just doing nine to five and don't want to put as much effort in uh, as you might see from other kind of workforces. But actually, the difference isn't in relation to the effort. So we do see the same discretionary effort when everybody's feeling well. So when you have the same kind of overall health kind of score, that the actual discretionary effort that's being put in is pretty kind of consistent. The difference is when when people are feeling unwell. Under 40s, when they do feel unwell, definitely have a much lower uh, kind of level of, of um, feeling unwell more of the time and therefore impacting that kind of uh, productivity, whereas over 40s tend to be less, uh, less unwell uh, and less kind of more working through things, So, which isn't actually great behavior, but that is what kind of happens uh, from that point of view. So we do see that younger workers are you know, less likely to have strong relationships. So I kind of alluded to it in that kind of moving to hybrid workforce and, and aspect of kind of isolation. And the reality is a lot of our younger workforce probably living in shared houses uh, and flats and various other stuff. So their workspace when they are working remotely is typically their bedroom uh, in, because they can't really use a shared space because there's other people kind of around. And it does impact that ability to, to kind of connect with kind of different people and how they kind of operate and work. And because they haven't got the historical kind of relationships and connections, it's much harder to kind of generate that kind of connection in the first place um, as well. So we do see that impact um, from that point of view. And there are obviously that kind of lack of connection um, and acceptance. They do have a much higher level of feeling of isolated um, amongst their friendships, but also from a workplace point of view. And the sad thing is, once we start to have see those kind of trends from isolation, that's then we see the other kind of spirals from wider health. So perhaps the high risk levels of drinking and other kind of unhealthy behaviors too. So it is something that needs to be, uh, to be addressed. So when we do talk to organizations, they say, well, what should I be doing? How do we kind of do something around that? So one of the key things that we have, we also measure is actually where organizations are actually proactively kind of supporting their workforce from a mental health point of view in particular, and, and elements of wider well-being too. And when we compare it to average, those that are kind of promoting it, we do see a two, two times greater higher level of scoring. So actually it does show that those organizations that are proactively kind of supporting their workforce, sharing kind of uh, best practice and kind of making an open kind of culture is higher. 
When we look at organizations that clearly don't actively promote it at all and it's very, very silent, it's even greater kind of difference, so four times greater from those that do. So it is something that is something we can actually see in evidence uh, from that point of view. And equally, uh, I haven't put the stat, stat on here, but um, lots of research has been done now from particularly in Standard & Poor's and organizations that um, do invest in kind of health and well-being and productivity and looking after kind of staff well-being and, and a, excuse me, from an element of safety uh, as well as mental health. Um, and actually lots of studies and trends now done over about 10, 15 year uh, kind of period. And those organizations that do promote it versus those that don't have typically outperformed their peers on the stock market performance. Anywhere between kind of an eight to 50% year on year outperformance. And therefore investors are now starting to see this more and more. So that actually a lot of organizations and leadership levels and, and kind of board levels are now being asked to kind of start to report on what are you doing from your well-being? How are you proactively doing looking after your workforce because it is now a key indicator from an investor as to whether it's an organization that they want to invest in. So you'll start to see more and more of those things coming through. But the reality is support for, for mental health is multifaceted. It's not, there's not one single silver bullet or product or service that you can do that's going to fix something in any organization or for any cohort of people. It requires a number of things from both policy and practices, so looking at from a compliance and risk management point of view, understanding the different benefits and services and programs and you know us and lots of other uh, providers are out here today, all got different bits that add aspects of kind of wider well-being and support, but actually need to get them to work together for the best benefits of your people. But it also needs to have, be led from a culture and a leadership point of view. It's all well and good having a great reward team, people kind of officer really championing kind of the wider kind of well-being of workforce if it's not being led uh, and embraced from a cultural point of view as well. So I can't fix that for you. That's something you have to kind of work on uh, individually. But where those organizations that do do it are seeing the benefits um, from it. Um, lots of other kind of stats, and I do uh, have probably too many slides here to kind of talk around. But interesting, when we look at kind of wider health and well-being benefits and services, actually most employees are citing those now as a reason to stay with their employer rather than flexibility. Over 40s, you can see it's much kind of closer kind of correlation, but actually in the under 40s, there is that kind of higher level of, of kind of need and want for kind of being looked after by their employer and being kind of feeling valued for what they do. I'm going to stop moving my left hand uh, and move this way, um, rather than necessary flexibility. So it's a really kind of important uh, understanding around that. Actually, if you do look after that workforce, they are going to be loyal to you um, and kind of stay with you as well. And equally, the question around salary, uh, and actually would you have rather more, more pay uh, than benefits and services? Obviously, a lot of people still do. That's not, you know, not going to pretend that doesn't uh, kind of happen. And certainly over 40s, it's a bit more kind of the financial, you know, actually do want that kind of cash. But actually, under 40s, again, you can see a much higher proportion do genuinely would rather work for an organization that's looking after their wider well-being and support rather than just pay. Appreciate this currently in the last kind of six months a very different kind of outlook to that. So we'll do some more research around that. But we can see that there is still that trend uh, from that point of view as well. Another kind of aspect of this, a lot of organizations go, well, you know, we provide different services for our employees, but they don't really engage with it. And actually, how do you promote it? So there is an element of kind of promotion and, and culture that we need to do in organizations. But actually, where we do, we do see that over 50% of the workforce or 50% of the workforce do want to be provided kind of tools and support to help them understand where they're at from a mental health or well-being point of view. They do want those assessments and tools so they can kind of self-guide, understand where they're at, but also then be guided kind of from that as well. So it is really kind of important. And obviously it would be remiss of me as an EAP and wellbeing provider to talk about the impact of kind of those that when they do need to access those services um, and get that kind of support, what actually does that mean in terms of some element of return on investment? So I have more stats in here and I'll share with you another time, but um, we do see that those people that are accessing, accessing kind of short-term solution-focused counselling, CBT-based kind of models, a number of kind of sessions, you know, we do see that reduction in terms of what's lost in terms of productivity um, over that period of time. Um, and so even though EAPs and other benefits like that typically have a low utilisation, anywhere kind of 2 10%, depending on country and, uh, and, and the like, you still see a pretty much for, for every pound, dollar, euro spent, kind of five times return on investment, even just based on that low level of utilisation. Um, the reality is you're never going to get everybody accessing support and services. In fact, if you had 
50% plus utilization on terms of counseling, I think you've got more of an issue in your business than actually <laughs> kind of what's there. I think there's another kind of conversation to have. But there's a difference in terms of actually supporting people and driving engagement with different tools to help them understand where they're at and build that resilience and tolerance versus need to kind of have access to that support um, as well. And one uh, thing that we do see a big kind of shift and change in is uh, obviously during COVID years, a lot of need to kind of move to a digital delivery and service model in terms of accessing health and wellbeing kind of services and support. So virtual GPs obviously became very kind of prominent as well as for us moving to a digital modalities of, uh, you know, video um, and telephonic kind of ser service and delivery. But we do see that actually a lot of people still want and prefer that in-person support. So it's really about finding that hybrid kind of balance. I think you know, as much as we do have great digital solutions, it's important to recognize that everybody's an individual and the way that they access support is also going to be a big factor in how effective that outcome is for them. Um, so it's important to recognize that actually digital alone or just in-person alone isn't the right answer. You do need to have a bit of a blend and how we kind of support people in their everyday as well. There's lots of other kind of stats here, and I'm just going to flick through a couple of these, but we do have different indicators that we see of what actually factors and to support people from a workplace kind of culture and actually how that improves kind of mental health. And I've not put the negative ones in here, but you can kind of guess what those kind of are as well. And we do have those in our reporting. But actually, those are cultures that do have the negative indicators. You do see a greater kind of even higher level of increase in terms of burnout, unsettled nervousness, and concerns with alcohol. Um, so it, it does go to show that culture and how we kind of support our people and how our line managers are working with our people can be a significant factor in overall kind of health and outcomes uh, for our workforce. Um, just a couple of two last slides and then I'll kind of uh, stop. Um, so a lot of kind of uh, 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 some of the clients I work with and different kind of brokers and partners that we work with go, well, in Europe, it's not that bad. We're pretty good, I think, in terms of looking at our mental health. Sadly, it's not. We're actually probably the, as a region, probably the worst um, in terms of kind of a higher risk levels of a mental health point of view uh, compared to US, Australia, and Canada, as you can kind of see there. So just highlighting that, if you think we are pretty well developed and evolved and, and open as a culture, actually we do see there are some significant uh, challenges still to be addressed uh, here, particularly um, in Europe. Um, if you can read that. <laughs> um, so we then measure kind of that strain. So if we kind of look at different cohorts from people with gender, age, and a number of children. So the closer to the circle you are, the circle you are, the more strained you are, and the further out the graph is, the less strained you are. So just picking on the children one. So if you have no children, pretty much less strained. One child, you're in trouble, light's gonna hurt you. Two, starts to get better because they can play with each other, it's a little bit easier to manage. As soon as you're outnumbered and you've got three, just give up, you're in trouble, you're really in trouble. So, you know, the proof is kind of a bit of a flippant kind of thing, but the reality is we do see that, and we can see that measure, we can see that demographic kind of change. But interestingly, the age one, yes, there's kind of that curve that is a much higher strain in terms of young workforce and getting better as kind of people get older. But actually, when we measured this from a few years ago, that 30 to 39 that were in the 20 to 29 kind of bracket, actually that's kind of, it's been flattening. So actually we're seeing that this is something that's still systemic and kind of continuing. And actually if we don't break some of these habits and changes, actually that kind of curve is gonna get flatter and flatter and closer to the strains throughout kind of our work, working lifetimes um, as well. As again, different measurements here, but I'm gonna stop there um, because there's too much to kind of cover. A um, little bit of a takeaway there in terms of, of what we're kind of seeing, but actually, as we can see, there's not one silver bullet. There's multiple things that we need to do to kind of improve and support employees when they need it and in the right way. But it's about how we access that and make it as, as easy as possible for them to do so as well. And I've just seen on the counter, I have two minutes left. So I think we'll open for some questions.